because this presentation is a great one for uh, troops and for venture crews. Some of you, some of you, some of you might be in front here, guys. Some of you might be over in front. Yeah. You know how this goes, right? I have no friends. I know. Okay, so um, our, uh, I'll say guest speaker, but it's, um, that's a good, our guest speaker this month is um, Dave Shapiro, and Dave's going to be talking on uh, about how to plan a high adventure float trip. Um, Dave has done this presentation at Canoe Copia. I don't know how many of you have you been to Canoe Copia in Madison. It's a gigantic uh, expo for all kinds of float sports, uh, kayaking and canoeing and uh, boundary waters uh, uh, guides and Alaska guides and uh, all kinds of um, uh, sea kayaking guides and sea kayak gear and etc 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 so a couple thousand people every year converge on Madison for something called Canoe Copia in March you might want to look for that and they also have presentations all through the whole weekend of Canoe Copia and they've done his presentation there so he's had a big audience of other youth groups not just scouts that uh, might want to consider planning a float trip. And I attended last year and it was a really terrific presentation, so we thought that this would be a great thing for us to do. One of the reasons I think we need to do things like this and have presentations like this is we do know that boys stay in the program longer if they have a challenge of high adventure stuff. Now maybe their high adventure stuff is getting up to summer camp. Maybe that's high adventure enough for them. But in our troop, our guys want something a little more than that, you know, generally. They want to go sea kayaking in the Pasal Islands, or they want to go to a Boundary Waters trek for, for you know, eight, ten days. They want to do backpacking in, the, in Montana. They want to do things like that. And that keeps the older guys in. Hey, if the older guys are in, guess what? They end up thinking, as long as I'm in, I might as well get eagle. As long as they're getting eagle, they're great leaders. So the high adventure part of your program is one of those that's going to keep those kids in that program. And I see a lot of nodding because you all do that sort of thing. So, but I'm guessing there are a couple folks who maybe say, I don't know how we could ever do a high adventure trip. I'm not qualified to do that. I've never done that before. I don't know anything about the Boundary Waters. Well, that's why we have Dave here. He's going to give you a lot of guidelines about how you can plan a high adventure float trip. I think I said sailing, and you're saying nothing, nothing to do with sailing. Sail. Right, right, we're not sailing. So we're talking mostly canoeing and kayaking, maybe. Yeah. Canoeing and kayaking. Okay, so... Um, Let's have uh, a, a warm welcome for Dave. Dave, thanks very much for coming. Are you guys okay seeing the screen from your angles? And again, there are more seats up front if somebody can't see well. We're having yourself. I did not build it off the right side of the screen for some reason. The resolution didn't quite match up. So what has to do with this goofy um, fruit kind of computer that he's using. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, plan a high adventure of full. So how many people have done this? Been into the Boundary Waters? And anywhere else other than the Boundary Waters? Where have you been? Apostle Islands. Apostle Islands. Anywhere yeah. else? Apostle Islands and the Boundary Waters. Okay. So that's when I tell people that I, I do a lot of wilderness camping, I, I always hear the same thing. I hear, oh, you like my nephew, blah, blah, blah. He does all kinds of stuff. He's been to the Boundary Waters. So that's always the big thing. Okay, so the first thing, now, yeah, I'm trying to say I, I built this presentation for other groups, not just scout groups. Um, so objectives, uh, scouts are really good at coming up with objectives. So you just might want to think about it. You want to do a trip, what you want to get out of it. Um, you know, I am uh, really big into teaching people how to canoe. I like getting the 50 mile rewards. Anyone have 50 mile rewards? Good. Where'd you go for a 50 mile reward? Uh, Philmont and Region 7 Canoe Okay, okay. So, um, <clears throat> 
you know, you might want to do a merit badge, you might want to have them get the merit badge before you take the trip, you, um, uh, and you might just want to have a good time. Maybe you just want to reward your, your older scouts. The second thing um, would be remiss if I didn't talk about youth protection and safety. The Boy Scouts do a great job of this. As you know, every leader has to take that uh, online training every two years. Um, so the, the biggies out there, the too deep leadership, the no one-on-one -on -one contact is, it's actually really easy to forget. You know, you're out there for days in the middle of nowhere with these kids and you really get to know them. And you don't think that, oh, I can't go walking down the beach with this kid alone when there's nobody else around. So try to remember that. Um, <clears throat> it's important to make sure that appropriate skills, that everyone has the appropriate skills, that everyone can swim if you're doing uh, swimming. Uh, if you're going kayaking, that you know how to do deep water rescues, or that you have a guide that can help you teach you to do deep water rescues. So make sure that everyone has the appropriate skills. As a leader, it's your responsibility to make sure you have suitable equipment. That would be to make sure everyone's got the proper life jackets, that you've got the, the boats that are going to work, that you're complying with any um, Coast Guard requirements. I mean, so all that is your responsibility. And uh, first aid and CPR. <coughs> of course, you're required to have CPR to do any float trip for the Boy Scouts. Um, first aid, they've, uh, the Boy Scouts have been pushing this uh, wilderness first aid training. In fact, I, there is one coming up. I know I saw it. I it's full. It is. Pardon me? It's full. It's full. Oh, I'm sorry. You got it. Yeah. There's actually some available to Colorado Waterman Council. Um, they're full. They're, they're, they're full. full, but the uh, weeknight ones are open. I just checked. Okay. Yeah. You can also take it at Rutabaga Paddle Sports in Madison if you want to in the spring. They have it. It costs them a lot more money. <clears throat> I recommend anybody take that. If, if nothing else, it'll teach you to be really careful because you, you get all these scenarios where you realize, oh my gosh, if this happened, what, what could we do? So. I also think it's a little unfair that adult leaders have to learn CPR. It seems to me like maybe some of the scouts should learn CPR because let's face it, who's going to have a heart attack when they're trying to hop a canoe through an important All right. So now we get to the fun part, and that would be coming up with a destination. So this is just a screen grab out of uh, Google Maps. Um, this is what I do all winter. I look at all these cool little green bits, and I think, ooh, what's up here? What's up here? Um, for scouting around here, I'm mostly looking for places that are within, say, a 10-hour drive, because that's the that's safe scouting you love for 10 hours. So there's a lot of really cool things. We live in a really good place for doing this. Of course, what's the place everybody thinks of when they think of doing the boundary waters? So here we have, there's the boundary waters, which is actually this, this shaded bit here. And then this part up here, this is Clarico Provincial Park in Canada. So, a lot of times people call this whole thing the Boundary Waters, but the Boundary Waters canoe area <coughs> is um, part of Superior National Forest, and Quetico is part of Ontario Provincial Parks. <coughs> and they're, um, they're very similar, but they're, they're different. On the one hand, it's approximately the same area, um, but then on the other hand, they let about 10 times the number of people go into the Boundary Waters compared to Quetico. So you can go into Quetico and not see anybody for days. You also may notice that like this area is it's a little oh sorry about that. That was weird. I hit the wrong button. <clears throat> okay. You can also see that like it's broken up. There's roads that go through these broken up areas. Um, and now there's a little closer map. There's also um, I can't quite see it here. A little more. <clears throat> these Dotted lines are motor routes. Now they're pretty low power motors, but it's <clears throat> you know it's not the same. There's no motors anywhere up in Quetico. Um, one of the common places we start is called Prairie Portage. This is the, the most common entry point into Quetico, and we usually we take because this is a motor route. We usually take a tow up there, and the only reason I do that is because there's motor boats out there towing people to Prairie Portage. So. Um, <laughs> Anyway, both parks, uh, they control the number of people in by entry points. These uh, red circles are entry points for boundary waters, and there's, oh, there must be 60 of them. Um, quite a few has fewer entry points. What they do is like, like Prairie Portage is the only ranger station there, but they, some people might have uh, a permit to go to Carp Lake, some people might have a permit to go up to Agnes Lake, some people might have a permit to go up to Sarah Lake. So it's kind of the same thing. Basically, they only let so many groups per day in each area. Um, once you're in there, you can kind of go anywhere you want. 
um, both have the same requirements. It's uh, the same restrictions. Um, nine people, four boats, and that's the most you can have. Uh, something else about uh, the boundary waters, this is just a section of the boundary waters, uh, and those are the campsites. In the boundary waters, you have to use an approved campsite, and Quetico, you don't. There's a lot of campsites in there. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of people who are looking for a campsite at 4 in the afternoon and can't find one. So, um, oh, and the other a couple of years ago, there was, a, uh, there was a spectacular fire up here, so this whole section got all burned out anyway. So, um, so anyway, that's the thing about the boundary waters. Um, other than that, very similar. These routes, you can get these routes from uh, websites of outfitters. All these different routes you can kind of pick out. You can get great descriptions, especially the boundary waters, because so many people go in there. We should, other than that, we, we, should, we should mention too that there is an official scout um, uh, organization up there, right? Northern Tier. Northern Tier is a base on there, right? There's a base right. in the Boundary Waters area, and if you aren't comfortable doing it yourself, they send a guide with you, a scout, usually a, an older scout or a young adult, yeah. with and you if you want. Interpreter. And, and guides or interpreters. They're interpreters, but, but they'll equip you and do everything you need. So if you're not comfortable, start working with Northern Tier, and they'll get you out there, and uh, you'll still... Yeah, I'll talk about that. Okay, so yeah, okay great. Right. Thank you. So anyway, so this is a typical campsite in the Boundary Waters. It's got the fire in there. Um, in Quetico, the campsites are not really established, so you might get uh, basically the camp. I mean, that's the fire ring in this campsite. This one hadn't really been used. Um, this is a typical toilet in the Boundary Waters. That is luxury, yeah, because in Quetico, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, and this, other than that, I mean, you've got these beautiful lakes. This one, I'm actually sitting in a canoe. I'm in Canada, I'm in Ontario, and that's Minnesota over there. So I'm looking at the international border. I don't know where it is. It's over there somewhere. <clears throat> this is a place called uh, Monument Portage. It's right along the border. It says Canada there. If you walk around to the other side, it says United States. Yeah. That is a really cool thing to do to for the scouts, because the trail goes on one side and then on the other side, and so the scouts are really get into it because you're walking back and forth across the border. You know, and frankly, in this day and age, who knows how much longer that would be possible. So I just think that's a really cool thing I was trying to stress. Other than that, you know, the lakes all look kind of the same. They get windy. That was pretty windy, that lake. Um, there's a lot of waterfalls, especially in Quetico. Uh, which you can portage around, so you don't have to go those falls. Uh, these are ancient pictographs. Um, that you know, natives they go on a vision quest and they paint what they saw on the rocks. <clears throat> but wherever you go, you're gonna get plenty of portaging and plenty of slogging through mud. Yeah. So quite a cool. And it's certainly um, that's by far my favorite place to go. I like quite a cool much better than the boundary waters. Um, it is more expensive. In the boundary waters, you pay for your entry permit for the group. And that's it for as long as your trip. In Quetico, it is per night, per person. They charge for the youth, they charge more for the adults. Um, it just has to do with the way the parks are financed. Uh, they also charge more if you come in from the southern border because um, they want to bring the Americans coming into their park. Okay, so that's Quetico. The next place would be the Apostle Islands. There we go, the Apostle Islands. The Apostle Islands. Uh, run by the National Park Service. It's a beautiful place to go kayaking. You wouldn't really want to go canoeing there, which you guys have been to the Apostle Islands. Um, <clears throat> so the thing about the Apostle Islands is you do have to be in um, assigned campsites. So if you want a moving trip, then you have to reserve this campsite for this night, and this campsite for this night, and this campsite for this night. The trouble is, this is Lake Superior, and Lake Superior has its own schedule. And there are many times you could be out there and not be able to move. So I. Yeah, went on my trip when we got stuck on there for like, uh, I think one of the islands for three days. For three days, yeah. right. I, I find that yeah. really, really stressful because, you know, when I went out there and I've got a group and I've got some younger people with me and uh, we were supposed to go pretty far, a 10 mile paddle, and I just, it was going to have to be a nice day, I wasn't going to do it. And the thing is, is that there, I knew that the paddle to get to the site we were in was an easy paddle. So we could very easily have some group coming in and we couldn't be, and, um, I found that very stressful, I didn't really like it. But it's a really cool place to go. This is a little bit of a closer map. Um, you can see there's group campsites, there's campsite, a group campsite on sand, now two group campsites. 
a couple group campsites on Oak Island, on this island over here, which I cut off, and then on Bassett Island. So we tried to do like this trip where we started out here and went around and then came back to Bayfield, but um, that just didn't work for us. So, and they thought I was nuts for planning a trip like that. But I like to move every day. You know, people go to the boundary waters and they go to a base camp, and I, you know, to me, that's not really. I like, I like to move every day, or almost every day. So, given all that, why, why go the sea caves? These things are just spectacular, and you can paddle into them. Um, as long as the waves aren't coming into the entrance, you can paddle through them. Um, these pictures of the caves are what uh, convinced our troops that they want to go do this. So that was a lot of fun. That was a trip we took a couple of years ago. So that's, uh, that's the main reason. There's also lighthouses. Okay, scouts don't get too excited about lighthouses, but some of them you can go into. And um, all bears. It's <laughs> this is the highest concentration of black bears in the upper Midwest. So um, fortunately, just about every campsite has a bear locker. So that, and this was amazing because I was I was just camped here with my daughter, but we uh, we after we cooked, we kind of walked on the trail to explore the island, and um, not 200 yards from my campsite there was a bear. But that bear did not know that there was food at my campsite. This bear knew. <laughs> this bear apparently had been harassing borders on this same beach um, the whole previous year. It would have been really nice if the Park Service had told us that before they gave us a permit to camp there. So <clears throat> after we left, they closed that island to all the landings. Anyway, so if you go, um, you know, you probably want a mixture of tandem and single kayaks. The tandem kayaks, they can hold a lot of gear. They're much more stable, um, very unlikely to tip over. These have um, center hatches which is kind of important if you, if your kayak, tandem kayaks don't have center hatches, when you're kayaking, you're gonna be bonking paddles with each other and that can be really frustrating. So if there's a center hatch, there's room for extra gear, there's room for people to paddle on the sink. You can get a lot of gear in those kayaks. <laughs> One of the things I do when I'm, when I'm kayaking, because the trouble with kayaks is you can't just put bags in them, you'll, you'll run out of room. So you pretty much have to unpack everything to fit them in the bag. So, you know, you've got your food all organized, and this is breakfast, and this is lunches, and this is dinner, and this is Cracker Barrel, and this is, you know. So <clears throat> what I do is I, I just get a bunch of stuff sacks, and then we, you know, stuff all the breakfast in one, all the lunches in another, maybe dinners will take two, and then assign everybody a bag. Here, this is your bag. When we load the kayaks, you unpack this bag and load it in your kayak, and when we get to camp, you put everything back in the bag. So. Hmm, didn't work as well as I thought it would, but it's a gimmick. <laughs> so that's the Apostle Island. I have a question. Yes? So if inclement weather keeps you blown into the island and you can't get to your next destination. Yes. And you missed your, your campground reservation, um, what's your suggestion for handling that? You have to contact the park service. Okay. And basically if you're going to stay in a campsite you don't have a permit for, they want to know about it. Um, if you're in close to the inner, the inner islands, your cell phones will work. Um, if you're way on the outer islands, you might need a marine radio or something, but most of the group's going to be on the inner islands. Yeah. So to continue on that, if you can't get to your next island, but somebody can get to your island that has it for that night, and they show up and you're stuck there. Um, they could, and again, that's why you call the park service. They may put you from a group site into a um, non-group site if it's open. They may put you on a beach. They may just make you cope with it. So, I mean, what would you do if you were there and another group came in? We'll make it work. And, and, right. Or, or, or if you came to a campsite and they were there, you would make it work. And that's, yeah, that's usually what happens. I just find it stressful. I like to have all my ducks lined up. I, the stressful part of the plan should be way done before I ever hit the water. So, so that's why I don't like it. It was a great trip. Uh, the marshals left. Some of the marshals were with me on that trip. Okay, so the next place. Are you, gonna, are you gonna talk? Are you gonna talk at a different time about um, planning your own or using uh, guides or yeah, that's all or services? Yeah, is that yeah. built? Is that later? We'll talk about that. Got some resources. Okay, good, good, good. Sure. Okay. Okay, so the next part is um, Picture Rocks National Lakeshore, in Michigan. Anyone ever been up there? Oh, good. Okay, so this is another park. Um, it's run by the Park Service. Uh, it's actually quite. It's like 43 miles long. <coughs> Um, it features this uh, 12 mile beach, it's 12 miles of mostly wilderness beach, it, um, much of it has no road access, um, same problem, assigned campsites for assigned nights, 
So it's kind of the same, the same problem. Um, I actually like this part better for backpacking because then you still get all the shore stuff, but um, um, you know, you backpacking, you're not going to get windbound in a backpack with site. So I've taken um, um, like a, some, they hold a symposium. They have a picture of rock and sea kayak symposium every summer. It's a good, good thing to go, and you can take day trips out there. And I've done that. So again, it's got really cool features. You know, cool shoreline features. Big, big old sea arch you can paddle through. Uh, these spectacular 70-foot waterfalls. Okay, they're not usually that big. It makes make a say, lot. So that's something. If you've been there, that's called Spray Falls. It's usually a spray shooting out over the lake, and not that torn. We were, we paddled over there. We were going to paddle under it. We didn't do that. <coughs> it's Bridal Veil Falls. Um, oh, and all these cool hidden coves. A lot of them you can get to from the water. And uh, yeah, the scouts do love these because you can climb all over these rocks. Oh, that's 12 Mile Beach. That is, that's my favorite beach anywhere in North America. It is 12 Mile Beach. You walk out there, there's no footprints except for birds and stuff. So, and the sand is, it's like hard. You know, you go to a beach and your feet sink in, but if nobody walks on it, the sand is hard. You can walk and walk. It's because no one swims there. Pardon me? It's because no one swims there. It's 30 well, degrees it's a, water. Well, it's a 12 Mile Long <laughs> Beach, and you have to walk to get to it. That's another reason. But yeah, they, well, I don't know. I assume the Boy Scouts, they'll jump, they'll dive right in. Okay, so the last area to talk about for destinations is up in the upper right corner there of um, Lake Superior. And it's really, it's almost completely undeveloped. This is a huge um, provincial park here. This is a huge national park here. This is a little provincial park. There's another little provincial park there. This is the third largest island on the lake, and it's a provincial park, the whole thing. Um, and then even some of the stuff here, there's no roads to go down here. And this is like a marine sanctuary, so they're not allowed to build roads within two miles or something of the shore anyway. And it turns out, even though there's nothing up here and very few people live here, it's just this one little, little town in Wawa, there's an outfit, a really highly regarded outfit right there for doing um, kayaking. And it, they're a great place to go with. <clears throat> so what kind of stuff is up there? Well, in Superior Provincial Park, um, it's got the famous Agua Rock uh, pictographs. Um, you can actually walk out there on a calm day. It notice the uh, the ropes going down into the water. <laughs> so if it's windy or wavy, you can't walk out there. I've seen uh, volunteers out there with like a hook thing in case people fall in the water so they can pull them back up. So <clears throat> um, just beautiful beaches and rocks. I love the rocks. It's just something about the just, I don't know, they're just different, they're smooth, they're really, really kind of cool. I like the rocks, I take a lot of pictures of the rocks. <clears throat> so I mentioned that, um, that outfitter, this is a picture of them from the air. It's, uh, it's called Rock Island, this is where the outfitter is. And it's, eh, it's not really an island, it's sort of connected, it used to be an island. This is the Mitch McCotton River, it dumps on into Lake Superior. So it's this really great place to take people <coughs> for kayaking because you can, it's got this protected area in here, you do all kinds of, of um, like you can do rescues and you can do practice and do all kinds of lessons. You can paddle up the river because the current isn't that fast. The water's warmer in the river, um, and then you got all you can go south to um, <clears throat> to Sugar Provincial Park. You can go west, so there's all kinds of cool places you can go. Well, one time I was up there, I was actually taking a class, uh, a kayaking class, one of the first ones they took. When I saw this thing, does anybody know what that is? That's a that's a Voyager canoe. That canoe, wait, I have notes on this. It's 36 feet long and you can put 14 people plus all their gear in there. So I took a picture of this and I went back and I showed people and uh, from the troop and they all thought it sounded uh, they all thought it sounded great. Well, the adults thought it sounded good. <laughs> so so we did a trip. We had it filled up. So as long as we were having this trip, I decided to go ahead and um, you know. Fill up Boys Life's the little fire. Anyone ever do that? To describe a trip they're doing to Boys Life. Well, they, you go on their website. You can describe their, and if they like it, they'll call you. And they did, and they sent a photographer with us, and so we got on the cover of Boys Life. So they were really excited about that. I have an issue here somewhere. Um, it's just two pages, but it's got pictures of the scouts and um, the stuff they did. So that was very cool. Oh, it was also really cool is that I got permission from the photographer to use some of his pictures. They sent me a CD with all his pictures, so I got to use them. So, um, yeah, they were spectacular. You know, these were these were kind of set up. He'd go climb up on the hill, and then we'd go paddle back and forth. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I saw, yeah, I like surprise too. 
Yeah, he, he's staying in the water. Yeah, like, he actually did one where he, he's in just his swim short. I mean, it's cold water, right? Lake Sakura is cold, and this was in, uh, this was June, so it's really cold in June. And he wanted a picture of the canoe paddling over him, so he had his paddling straight towards him, and he goes out of the water and takes some pictures. So, a very brave guy. He was really interesting. I threw this picture in because you can see they're, they're heating up taco meat in a cook kit over an open fire. And the reason they're using an open fire is because, for some reason, <clears throat> when they were getting all the stuff and throwing it in the canoe to get started, their stove didn't make it. The propane bottle for the stove made it, but their stove didn't make it. So, um, <clears throat> so you know, I was, we had about half adults and half scouts on this trip, so I was kind of over on the adult side. Just, okay, let's see what happens. And so then I finally went to the leader, he was their leader on this trip, and, and I said, okay, thinking that, okay, we're going to have to conserve fuel on our stove, we'll go back and forth. And he said, oh, no, we'll just heat it up in the, on an open fire in our cook kits. I think we do that. I'm like, okay, great. And <clears throat> so I thought about giving him a lecture about making sure you're heating it on coals and not open flame and all this stuff. And then, well, you know, it's the first meal, we can see what happens. <clears throat> so that, it, it worked out really good and they really liked it. It does not work for pancakes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so not, they ran out of granola bars that day. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'll let them go once or twice so they don't really have a meal. But after that, I sort of got involved and made sure that, okay, let's make sure you get some real meals. Why don't you use our stove to make these, these uh, quesadillas that you have the next time. So, <clears throat> but it was a cool trip. It's a really good trip to take if you have a group of younger people or you have a bigger group. Um, it's a beautiful area to go canoeing, so we had a really great time. Was, um, you can't really just take one of these canoes, nobody's going to let you take it, it's like a $20,000 boat. Um, so there's a guide, he's right off the edge right there. Anyway, so we had a guide, um, so he came with the boat, and basically his job was in the boat. Once we hit land, he, he just, he wasn't part of it. So except that, you know, we feed him. So um, this is our photographer, so he was really interested in a bunch of points life stuff. Okay, so destinations. Now, there's always more. I know, I think I talked to some people down to Woodland Caribou, you said, it. some I don't remember. Um, I want to take a trip into Wapakimi. Um, this is Lake Nipigon, and there's some parks around it. Um, but this is, you know, they call that the first of the Great Lakes because it actually is part of the, all the water here flows up the other way. And this flows into the Great Lakes and out the other direction. So that's, that's kind of the headwaters of the Great Lakes, if, if you will. So, I, you know, I'd like to take a trip up there, but it's, you know, it's two days driving, so it could be harder to do with the sun trip. Okay, so <clears throat> now that I've talked to you into going to Canada, right? What, there's one, what's the one that um, we go to? Did you write in the upper Michigan? Sylvania? Sylvania. Sylvania, uh, right. Yeah, Sylvania. The trouble with Sylvania is your group size is so small. Yeah. You can only have six people. It's not a very big place relative right. to boundary waters. So, so yeah. and, you know, one here trucks. And one time I was in Sylvania, and this bugs me. It really bugs me. I was in Sylvania, and I was just there with my wife, and we were just hiking. It's beautiful hiking trails, old growth forest. And this group of scouts camped on the lake, and another group of scouts on the other side of the lake. And they're shouting back and forth and talking about things. And it's like, okay, why isn't there a leader reminding them about leave no trace and to not do that? So um, I, I never tried to take a group of scouts like this. Okay, crossing the Canadian border. I, I get more questions about this than anything. Um, passport, who needs a passport? Yeah. So the rule, that's not true. The rule is, okay, the rules are fuzzy. You gotta understand. The rules are, anyone 16 or older needs a passport. Except if you're traveling as part of a youth group, you only 18 and older need a passport. So, um, and you have to understand the passport rule is actually not a Canadian rule. You don't need a passport to go to Canada, you need a passport to get back. So, <laughs> but, but a border agent may not let you go to Canada if you don't have the proper documentation to get back. Um, you do need a photo ID, so all your, um, all your scouts are going to have to get a photo ID. And I always like to use, uh, have a notarized consent letter. I'm traveling with teenagers. If I'm going to cross the border at a, at a regular border station, then I, you know, I want to have a notarized letter. There's no official requirement. I just saw it as a recommendation on a couple of websites. I decided to do it. And I, and I, you know, really the thing is, you have to convince the border guard that you get to let you into Canada. And it's really you can't argue with them. You can't say, oh no, you don't understand the rules. No, he has to decide that it's safe to let you into Canada. So that's. 
That's the thing to live up to. <clears throat> if you're going to go into that prairie portage, like I was talking about, if you're going into Quetico, and there's no ranger station up there, you need something called remote area border crossing permit. It costs some um, thirty dollars uh, for adults. It's free for youths. You basically just send in a photocopy of your passport, um, and then they do a, like a criminal background check on you. Um, a fairly thorough criminal background check, I would say. So um, at, you know, just to know, if you have a DUI on your record, you can't go into Canada. So, and that's I've heard horror stories about people yeah. discovering that in the last. Yes, I, I had a friend who, who got mm -hmm. stopped at. at uh, Niagara Falls crossing, okay. and it costs them a lot of money. Um, yeah, I bet you know I, you can you can resolve it. You know, there's ways to resolve it. But, um, um, okay, bring food and gear into Canada. Um, there's no food duty. Years and years ago, they used to charge us food duty. There's no food duty um, as long as you're not bringing anything to leave. You know, like you can bring all your bullets, all your equipment. Um, returning to the U.S. Now, there's a couple things to remember. One. If you're, well, if you drive across the border, and um, so, you know, you bring all your food and stuff in, um, they, I've never had them harass me about bringing food into Canada, but coming back out, they'll even tell you you shouldn't bring fresh food in, even if, you, even if it originated in the United States. So then, if I'm up there and I have any, like, oranges or something, I would just leave them there, like, leave them with the outfitter. There's all these guys in the outfitter that'll eat anything, right? Um, if you cross the border at the border uh, with the remote area border crossing permit, that's a Canadian thing. That is not a U.S. thing. So that gives you permission to go into Canada, but not permission to enter the United States. So what happens is after you get back into the United States and then you're driving back towards Ely, Minnesota, there's a custom station there and you're supposed to pull in and then re-register that you came back. Um, I've been there where it was so late in the year that they weren't open. And then they want you to go to Duluth. But it was a weekend and the office was an opening to lose. So then they want you to go to International Falls, which is the wrong direction from where we're going. And so we didn't do it. They don't know we went into Canada. So, uh, but with the scouts, we all. You're here the scouts. <laughs> this is a personal trip. Around with the scouts, it's early enough in the year. And we just stop in, and it's kind of a cool thing they like to do. They go in there and they all show their ID and the guy picks their information. And I think it's kind of part of the part of the experience. <laughs> I think I think that's why that notarized consent letter is a good thing too, because when you come back, you're not the parent necessarily, and sometimes they want to know that you are authorized to be taking these kids and they're not trafficking in right. kids' bodies and that sort of thing. You know? I mean, yeah, it was actually a suggestion on the uh, yeah. uh, internet and through the website. Yeah. I, can, I can add some specific details to that. Sure. Even if you are the parent, <laughs> if both parents are not present, wow. you yeah, must you have that notarized consent letter or you're going to get raked over the coals. You could. Yeah, you could. not could, will. Wow. It's, it's, it all depends on who you get when you come in. I, I've had them wave me through and not ask me a question. I've had them ask me a question. Maybe Steve just looks more suspicious. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, and, you know, and frankly, if you get a notarized consent letter and uh, you have a scout who's, um, whose parents are separated, then you might want to get both parents on it. It just it wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt. Okay, so food and equipment. So outfitted versus self-supported. Now I'm big on self-support. I want to do as much of the stuff as I can because I'm trying to teach these scouts how to do this themselves. Um, and you can do anything from a fully guided trip where they do everything for you, including clean your fish and provide all the food and cook all the meals, and um, which you know, I don't think that would be what, what you're after, all the way to I've heard of people who will beg and borrow canoes from down here and go into the boundary waters and they kind of doing their whole trip for about $200. So <clears throat> I, like to, um, I like to run canoes from an outfitter um, just because they're the right canoes, the Kevlar canoes from that country, they're easy to carry, um, and if you damage one, they're usually not a problem. Uh, plus, if you have an outfitter, you just there's lots of you know they can give you advice on, on your route. They can tell you, oh, you don't want to go that way. This river's too low, or there's just a lot of information you can get from an outfitter. So it's nice to use an outfitter. <coughs> group equipment. Group equipment. I have some notes on group equipment, so I want to forget this. <coughs> so, uh, well, tents. You know, you need tents for your group. You, 
you sometimes with all the scouts, everyone wants their own tents, so that's a bad idea. You're going to get to these campsites, and there's not going to be room to set up eight or nine tents. So, um, on the other hand, I like being in my own tent. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you do want to try to minimize the tents. So I like to. Our troop has uh, four-man tents. So I like to put three scouts in the four-man tent. And frankly, the the four-man tents, if you figure out the weight per scout for three scouts, it's really about the same as a backpacking tent. So, uh, what else did I have on group equipment? Also, one thing: if you're, if you're kayaking. You need to probably um, pare down and get more people jammed into a tent. So if you have a tent that's rated a three-person tent, you should put three people in there. Pamela and I would be comfortable in a three-person tent. We're not comfortable in a two, but for kayaking, you want to do a two, person, two people in a two-person tent because you don't have that much room in all the all the holes of a kayak. Yeah, it does. You know, so canoeing you have much more much more space. You do in a kayak. You know, all the trips of kayaking. You know, you got this tent is to uh, take it apart. You know, take the poles out, take take the thing, take it apart, just fit it better. You can you can get a lot of stuff in, in those tents. Okay, uh, group of cook kits. You know, what you want to do is go. Th I, I have I always have like a packing meeting um, where we're going through all the food, we're packing all the food, and um, and then it's always like, okay, for this meal, what do you need to cook it? For this meal, what do you need to cook it? For this meal, what do you need to cook? And do this little thought experiment, and then pare down the cook kits all in the parsley. Oh, and water filters. So I always bring a water filter and a backup water filter because boiling water is not fun. So you know, years ago we used to drink uh, drink the water without treating it, and um, a lot of people still do, but that really can't do that in front of scouts. <laughs> not advisable. No, not really. Okay, personal gear. So you know, personal gear. I, I have a I have some resource sheets with with. Um, just websites of all the different outfits and stuff I'm talking about on the back, I do a little packing list. So you can get these things anywhere. But this is just, every year I pull it out, I go through it, I make little changes to it. Um, but that's about 10 years worth so of those. Are we'll those are handouts? Those are handouts, yeah. 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 Uh, the other thing I do in personal gear is I tell all the scouts to bring their mess kit, which every scout has and they never use, right? So they all bring their mess kit, they all have to bring their own cutlery, and then have them bring uh, like a cup. And um, to me, that just simplifies everything. You know, you're not going to have the patrol box with all the dish pans and the bleach, and you just can't do all that stuff. And so, basically, just you guys, these are your dishes. You have to keep them clean. Um, you can teach them how to use just a tiny bit of soap to wash their dishes, but then they keep their own stuff clean. They keep track of it. It just makes the whole um, cleaning up after meals just much, much simpler. Personal gear with us. Ah, uh, yes, um, cotton. I swear, this after this last summer's trip, I'm gonna just completely ban blue jeans and cotton sweatshirts. Just they're not allowed. Just because you know when they get wet, they'll be wet the entire rest of the trip. And then we had kind of a wet trip, and one kid fell in, and he's down to his last pair of dry clothes. I made him spend the entire rest of the trip in his rain suit. Um, I, you know, I just and this guy, you know, we get into a campsite and the string up all this stuff. It's just never gonna dry. So I mean, you know, does everyone know why? Cotton is bad. <laughs> you tell, I mean, you ever heard the phrase "cotton kills"? Yeah. Cotton kills because you get wet and you can't get you can't get dry and you can't get warm. You need synthetics, something that will repel water, or you need uh, even wool, which it, if it gets wet, it'll still keep you warm. But, but cotton just won't. <clears throat> menu planning. So menu planning is fun. Um, there's you know, on the one hand, a lot of people don't realize that there's a lot of food that's in your refrigerator that doesn't necessarily have to be refrigerated. You know, I, they, you can't keep milk in your pack, right? But cheese, what was cheese originally was to preserve milk. So cheese will last a few weeks. Eggs will last a few weeks. In America, we're the only people in the world that refrigerate our eggs. So, um, butter too? Uh, butter's fine. Sure, there's just, there's all kinds of stuff that you can that you keep in your refrigerator that you don't necessarily need. There's also... Has anyone ever tried that, uh, like the Mountain House, those freeze-dried meals? Oh, no. yeah. You tried them? Yeah. yeah. Those are good. Some of them are good. Oh, yeah. See, that? I have a story about that. There, there's a couple that are really good, and there's a couple that are really off. That are really bad. <laughs> yeah. So the, the group I took last summer, they had, they were just not doing a good job of their menu planning. They just weren't doing a good job. And I, you know, I'm trying to let them do it, and they come up with these ideas. I'm like, well, do you have a recipe for that? How's that going to work? And they're just not really... They're not really doing it, so I decided to simplify things. So I did one day where it was all freeze-dried, and I just bought all the freeze-dried food. 
and um, figuring that they'd see how horrible it was. And it was another day where I did Scott Master's Choice, where I did a big pot of spaghetti. I, I dehydrated my own meat, my own sauce, and made a big pot of spaghetti, you know, trying to teach them that. The trouble was, they liked the freeze-dried food. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's, it's really expensive. It's so, and, and if you want simple meals like that, you know, there's Bear Creek soups, and there's Zadarans, and there's just, there's so many meals out there that you can just go to the grocery store and you can find the stuff, and it'll uh, it's just a lot cheaper and it tastes a lot better. It takes a little bit longer to cook. You will want to repackage things. So if you do the Zatarans, take it out of the cardboard box. The cardboard box stays behind. You take the envelope. Make sure you cut the recipe off the box and put it in your Ziploc bag with, with, a, with the Zatarans. And you want to double bag everything too. So if you should capsize, your food doesn't get wet. You know, you don't want the rice getting wet before you're ready to cook it because it's spoiled then. So you got to double bag everything. But it's, uh, yeah, you, it's astounding how much garbage comes out uh, when you do that. So, okay, uh, how much does it cost? So budgeting, that's always a consideration. So what I did is I just set up a sample trip to Quetico. See, you keep hearing me talk about Quetico because I don't find the boundary watch kind of crowded. You know, the way I look at it is the scouts aren't going to care that much, right? Um, I've only got so many trips left in me. So I'm going to do the ones that I want to do. You know, it's at least every year they get a little harder to do. So we went to Quetico again. I've never taken a scout group in the Bobby Waters. So we did seven nights, uh, seven days, six nights, 50 miles. If they have two adults, right? Six years. I don't like putting three people in a canoe. Um, it's just to me, canoes are tandem. That's one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of uh, Northern Tier. Now Northern Tier does a great job, but they always put three people in a canoe. You have your crew of eight people, and they have one interpreter. So you've got three canoes packed with with people. So somebody's in the middle, like sitting there, or maybe trying to paddle. And, you know, I'm an ACA canoe instructor. I have no idea how to teach people, three people to paddle the same canoe. Two people, one people, that's what we learn, right? <clears throat> and now it's on Moose Lake. I can't really go back to the map, but um, Moose Lake is the same. That's where Northern Tier is based on Moose Lake. So as an outfitter that I use, it's just a little further down the lake. It's just really convenient. Um, and they can give us a tow up the Prairie Port so we can start our entire trip in Canada. So what does it cost? Well, the park fees, <clears throat> I split this up into what was in Canadian dollars. So the park fees, you got the reservation fee. These are the camping fees that are approximate. The adults have to do the RABC, the remote area board crossing permits. That's $30 each. And uh, you do have to account for an unfavorable exchange rate. Um, right now, it's great. I'm um, Jesus. Your U.S. dollar will buy you about a dollar fifteen in Canada, so that's great. But I've also been there where the U.S. dollar only buys you ninety five cents in Canada. So um, <clears throat> outfitter fees: a Cadillac canoe is say forty dollars a day. Toyota Prairie Portage is twenty four dollars a person. Um, not we don't do it this way. This is a real traditional way to do it. You stay in their bunkhouse. They charge you fourteen dollars each. And you get a pancake breakfast to send you off so you can get an early start the next morning. Um, we just stayed in a regular campground that was a bit outside of Ely, but this is just another way to do it. Just because I, I can't sleep in one of those bunk houses. I like my own tent. Did I say that? <coughs> uh, group expenses. Now, I always budget $15 per person per day for food. Um, that's getting a little harder to do, but that's still, that's still we still stay within that. Um, Cars, I think I, well, I built this for a presentation in Madison, so that's how I got the distance, but um, gas was, what, $4 a gallon when I did this? <laughs> $2 a gallon, but I think if you budget, you better figure it's going to go back to four. Um, propane, I was using the one-pound propane bottles, um, just, just any kind of, whatever kind of fuel you need. Um, maps, I like to have um, at least a set of maps for each canoe. So, uh, and then a water filter, the water filter I use is like a big bag and then the water drips through it and then by the end of a week that core is shot so I make a buy new one. And of course everybody wants patches. Right? So um, adding all that up, this trip comes up to $437 each. That includes transportation up there. Um, we actually managed to do it, we crammed everybody into one vehicle and um, I brought my own canoe so it's one canoe we didn't have to and we got it down under $400 a person. So that was it, this would easily cost you over six hundred dollars a person if you go to Northern Tier. So a lot of that's because you're paying for that. I have no idea what kind of food they use. If they use the whole freeze dried stuff, they might. Um, and then you have to have that interpreter. So, um, so you're paying for that person and all their camping expenses. 
Okay, so just, um, you know, other things to think about is to know your limits. You know, it's real easy to sit around, oh, we can go here, we can go here, we can go here, but you get out there and you got a 50 pound canoe on your back and these trails, I mean, they're not, they're not really trails, they're just maybe a space through the trees. They're often very rocky, hard to walk on. Um, it, know what you can do. It, 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 you know, it's kind of stress to the group that they need to be in shape, but it's frankly the other leaders who are definitely are usually not in good enough shape for this. Um, and maybe when you do your route, have some bailout points. Like, okay, we want to do this, but if we're not doing that well, we'll do this instead. So, you know, maybe you wanted to do a 50 miler, but for one reason or another, you can't get it. Out. <laughs> shakedown trips, good idea to have a shakedown trip. Um, I like to do shakedown trips on the Wisconsin River because you can camp anywhere on the river, because it's really inexpensive, because it's easy to get to. I could do kayaking or canoeing on the river. So that's a great place to do a shakedown trip. Um, Sylvania's okay, except it's a wrong group size, you know. So, <clears throat> float plan. So, whenever you go out, you should file a float plan. Now, it doesn't have to be anything super formal, but a float plan should have, at a minimum, you know, a description of your group. How many people, what are their genders? How many boats do you have? What colors are they? How many tents do you have? What colors are they? Where is your car going to be parked? What are there any outfitters you're using up there? So you can put their name and phone number down <coughs> and the name and phone number of the park you're going to be in. And all that stuff is there in case you go missing and don't come back. That they have information to come and go find you. So the floor plan should be left with, um, you know, someone back at home. Uh, and um, certainly if you're using an outfitter, you at least want them to know where you're going. If you enter Quetico, you have to check in at a ranger station. They'll actually do one for you there. They're going to ask you the color of your boats and the makeup of your crew and the color of your tents and all that stuff. So, <clears throat> full plan. It's probably important to tell people that if you know you're leaving your spouse at home, is to warn them that you know if the weather is bad, you can't get out. You can't get out. And so they they don't call and panic until you're at least 24 hours late. So that's what I tell people. You really don't want to search and rescue for something that's just not, not necessary. <clears throat> and the last thing would be outdoor ethics. Now, everyone, leave no trace. They start with Cub Scouts. And leave no trace, leave no trace. I think they pounded so much that people don't know what it means anymore. Um, I don't know how many times I've seen a troop number carved into a rock or, or something like that. And I, you know, I don't need to see that. Or the, the scouts shouting back and forth across the lake. This is all stuff that is contrary to leave no trace. And you can't really blame the scouts for not knowing this stuff. They're kids that are going to do what they're going to do. But there was an adult leader in that campsite when those kids carved into that rock. And there were adult leaders with those groups who were shouting back and forth. So it really is the adult's responsibility. Kids are going to want to get loud, but some really carries over the, over the water. And uh, that's it. Other than that, it's, you know, be safe and have fun. Um, a few, just a few things I want to mention on um, Pneucopia. Um, I'll be doing a presentation. Um, I'm going to redo this one. It'll be kind of similar. I'm doing that in on March 13th. <clears throat> I'm also doing one on, um, on tying knots. But it turned in from, it turned in from a regular 45-minute presentation about knots into an a interactive demonstration where I have to be there for three hours. 20,000 people go to this event. Is anybody here good with knots? <laughs> no, all these scouts good with knots. I could really use some help showing people knots. <laughs> <laughs> so Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, or all day. And it's Saturday afternoon. I, well, they just got the title of schedule, and it's um, Saturday afternoon from one to four is when the knot demonstration will be. So right at that. My my um, presentation on this kind of stuff is going to be Friday evening. So, but uh, yeah, I, I have a big pile of short pieces of rope, and you okay. get free admission. Um, actually, <laughs> the thing is, you can't. Well, I, die. I don't know how many people I, or how many um, how many free passes I could talk them into giving me. This is for a tandem thing, so but they, yeah, but they. Um, the, the thing is, for the area where the presentations are, you don't need to, to, to pay the entrance. So I need to pay the entrance fee if you're going to go and go shopping. So I see you get in and, uh, and do that. But we could try. You know, I'll still. So, but yeah, I could really use some help with that. The other thing I wanted to talk about was I came up with this idea is that, you know, this talk may be great, but you may still feel like you couldn't do this, but you really want to do it. So I have, I have a sheet on this also. I come up with this idea of doing a canoe camping school, and it would be like a trip for scout leaders who, um, who want to learn how to do this. Um, I, 
Uh, I am an ACA canoeing instructor, so part of this whole trip would be a complete class on all the basics of flat water canoeing, rescues, weather, um, all the stuff about navigating, everybody would have a great chance to navigate, lots of different things we can do about food and menu planning. Um, so I, I picked dates, I came up with what the cost would be. Um, it would be, this would be starting at Ely, Minnesota, it would not be starting from here. So I, if anyone is interested, I have a sheet on this, I have my contact information, it's also on this sheet. If you, um, want to call me and ask about it. Uh, what's your email? Uh, Pardon me? Your email, email address? The email you address. Take a sheet. Okay. I got, I got a pile. So um, that's it. You know, Trevor Clark's one of, this is how I ended the other one. I wanted to thank Trevor Clark Photography. That was the guy who did the, all those Voyager pictures. And all the other Troop 218 leaders who let me use their pictures because I am awful about taking pictures when I'm on these trips. So uh, I just, I, the camera's in the bottom of my drive bag. It stays that way the whole trip. So then we get back, like, oh, I need pictures for presentations. So, and Rudebeck is the place where I was going to be. So, um, oh, and the other thing is, so I have these research sheets. I mentioned that. Take a research sheet, take a, a, a food camping. Um, and I really, if anybody thinks I helped them, send me a group picture. I'm starting a collection of these, so I'd really love to see a group picture of them. So, we did that, did that in about 45, 15 minutes. So, any questions? Yeah. Why do you see us using Kevlar canoes in, uh, instead of like normal aluminum canoes that most troops have? Um, aluminum so the question canoes was, why, why, why Kevlar instead of aluminum? Right, because a Kevlar canoe weighs between 30 and 40 pounds, and the aluminum canoe weighs about 75 pounds. Okay. He's got, really he's got so many I actually won't even do, try it anymore with yeah, an aluminum canoe. I'll use a... Uh, I have something called a Roilex Q, which they don't make anymore. It's about 50 pounds. Um, I use that. So, and, and that you can just bang into rocks. They won't hurt it, because they don't, they don't make those anymore. So like, if you go to Northern Tier, you, it's either aluminum canoes or Kevlar canoes. They charge a lot more for Kevlar canoes. And they are really protective of their Kevlar canoes. So basically, you see the Northern Tier people coming through, and they walk into the water till it's this deep, and then set the canoe down, and then load all the gear in it so the canoe never touches the ground with any weight in it at all. Because they're warned that if they put a scratch in it, they're going to have to buy it. So, um, but the outfitter I used, they gave us these really beat up canoes. In fact, we did duct tape one of them to, get, to keep it from leaking. You know, I'm sorry. If they drop it at the end of the porridge, I'm not going to have a fit. So, <clears throat> other questions? Did I inspire anybody? Does anybody yeah. want to do that? <laughs> no? I, I have a question for all of you to do when we're done. Okay. That's it. I'm, that's all I've got. Would anybody here want us to add another topic or two supportive topic about this main one? So, for example, we talked about um, maybe where are some good outfitters and what experiences do we have with outfitters so we can share some of those notes. Would we want to talk about food and food preparation and menu planning and dehydration and that sort of thing? Would that be of interest to you all? So, um, I guess I'm just asking, would anybody be interested in some of the follow-up, more detailed, uh, topics that come out of a major one like this? Yeah. You think you'd like that? Food preparation. Food prep? Yeah, okay. Last time you did one, it was good. It was good. And I know Dan Sakura helped out with that. Yeah. Okay, so food prep, so dehydrating, what? things like that would be good. Menu planning? Okay. <coughs> okay. I, I mean, we, we have a lot of experience. We can do that. I don't know, Dave, if you'd be available too, we can talk about doing something like that. Okay, we'll try to aim for another one in the, in a, in a, in the coming months, okay? Is anybody here not gone on a high adventure trip because they don't think they can. Has anybody here done that? Or the boys want to, but we're just not capable of it, or, or whatever. I, I'm not asking you to raise your hand now. But if that's the case, make sure you do ask some of us veterans who've been around a little while for some experiences, because we can help you out. We can make sure that, uh, that we'll get you with the right um, guides and that sort of thing. So you don't have to invent everything on your own. You do not have to invent everything on your own. So Dave mentioned that maybe your first one, um, you can get, uh, the, the, first of all, this is Spectrum. There's all kinds of help where they do everything for you, and the other end of the spectrum is, like Dave does, he does everything himself, doesn't need anybody. There's a Spectrum. And so 
wherever you feel you're comfortable on that spectrum is uh, where you're going to want to plan your outing. But you do want to plan some outings. You do want to get the kids up to these areas or backpacking trips or something. You do want to do that. So you can go with a trip that's totally handled for you. They provide, I've seen people come from the city with their city clothes and they'll outfit you as far as clothing and everything. Now you're going to buy some clothes out there and it's probably a little expensive. But I'm just saying that's one end of the spectrum where they, where you, you, you bring nothing and they get you totally outfitted, um, including all the equipment, all the gear, all the food, all the everything. And then there's some where you can bring your own gear, but they'll provide you with the food and canoes and everything. So, and we'll we'll talk other trips then too. Okay, I, you well, know, if you take, uh, you know, take my resource sheet. Yeah, it's yeah, got my email yeah. address, my contact information. Yeah. If you have any questions, just email me. I mean, this yep. is why I, I'm still, this is why I'm still doing this because I still I, I, I love these kinds of trips. And that's a resource. And, right. um, you know, my own son is he's been out of scouting for years now, yeah. but um, I I really my goal is I want to get more people doing this. I want you go to these paddling things and everyone looks like me or him, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, we need you know, younger people Being gray and bald and, you know, yeah. So, <laughs> so you want more people to do this, but then it's crowded at the boundary water, so you don't So go to camp. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> it's, and you know what? It's less crowded than it used to be. Or time of year. Okay. Well, I know. So, yeah. okay. so, okay. If you have a particular day in July, you want this particular lake, you have to put in for the lottery in January. Together. Which ends tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 um, We'll, we'll add something about preparing food for a high adventure trip. We'll add something like that in one of our future meetings. And, uh, and then Dave has his uh, contact info here. And if you have any questions, make sure you contact some of us, okay? Because we've got a lot of veterans here in the room who've done this sort of thing before. Great. Thank you very much, Dave. Thanks very much for doing this. Anything else? Otherwise, I think we can go home and watch the rest of that uh, championship game, huh?